Good evening from the News Radio 1120 and 93.7 FM KPNW Studios. I'm Bill London, and I may or may not be wearing pants. This look at the news brought to you by Dr. Michael Bratland of Chris Dental, where if you call him today, they'll see you today. He's the only dentist I know that actually gives you his private cell number. He does. I sometimes call him up in the middle of the night, just see how he's doing. All right, here's a look at some of the stories we're following. Well, the issue of cities and the way that they deal with the homeless has become a political flashpoint. And in the small Lane County town of Cottage Grove, it became a huge issue. Now, after the city council in that town set up two unattended homeless camps on public property right near businesses and neighborhoods, residents voted Tuesday to deal with a recall to remove three city councilors who were behind the idea. The two camps were considered by many living there in Cottage Grove to be an unmitigated disaster with trash, crime, trespassing, human waste and needles littering the area, and it sent businesses and a lot of residents over the edge and demanding some sort of change. Well, the city council didn't, and so they voted on a recall, and it was successful. 61% of voters opted to recall all three, all three of them losing by almost exactly the same number, 61% plus a little. The unofficial results of the special election show Cottage Grove City Councilors Mike Fleck, Chalice Savage, and Alex Dreyer are now officially recalled. The remaining councilors and the mayor will determine on how they're going to seek and interview potentials individuals to fill those vacancies. The recall was driven by a political action committee called Save the Grove. Then north, up on the highway, the city of Albany officials just started the process of closing down a homeless camp in Albany. It was called Marvin's Garden, and it was the city's designated space for unhoused people to sleep, and it was created as part of Oregon House Bill 3115. Now, the site was meant to provide a location and as a transition point for services and more for people who live there. Well, on Tuesday, the folks in Marvin's Gardens received notice. You've got 30 days to leave. Matt Harrington with the City of Albany said that safety issues are the big driver of the decision to shut the site down. Now, according to him, that plan and the site is not working as intended. Harrison or Harrington went on to say, a lot of it stems from the fact that our service provider partners are no longer safely able to enter the site to provide services. Now, that closure follows a violent assault that happened last weekend that sent one person to Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland for life-saving surgery. Public officials were left wondering if Marvin's Garden is safe for service providers to enter. They finally decided, no, it's not. There's currently at least 40 homeless folks who sleep at Marvin's Gardens currently. Where are they going to go? Don't know, but they were told to leave. So the Oregon Secretary of State certified Initiative Petition 17 for the November ballot. The measure would increase corporate activities taxes on businesses, large and small, and then distribute the proceeds to every Oregonian once a year in the form of a check. It's actually a 3% corporate activities ta uh, tax not based on net, but based on any economic activity, basically the gross. Well, now it has one fairly prominent and powerful opponent, Governor Tina Kotek. Kotek says that it would punch a huge hole in the state budget. Antonio Gisbert, the chief petitioner, hoped progressives would support the measure, which includes two concepts the redistribution of wealth, in other words, socialism, and a form of universal income. 
Now, last year, Kotech recognized that high taxes are an impediment to Oregon's economic recovery and actually encouraged local leaders not to seek any new taxes for the next three years. For the scheme to work, the taxes would have to provide $3.1 billion a year every year to pay every Oregonian $750 at the end of the year. Now, Portland could be a pretty good example of what is to come if this thing passes. Portland voters levied a slew of new taxes on businesses for the environment, for homeless support, mental health services, and created a situation where Portland has the most heavy tax burden on businesses in the nation. And the result has been businesses leaving Portland in droves for more tax-friendly havens. Of course, none of this takes into account the administrative costs to the state and taxpayers in collecting the money and then distributing it by check to every person cradle to grave. Well, only in Oregon. Actually, not only in Oregon. Apparently in Montana, too. A new statewide coalition of radical environmentalists want to add an environmental rights amendment to the Oregon Constitution. It would enshrine the right to a healthy environment in a Bill of Rights. Now, proponents say making the right to a healthy environment a fundamental right is key in the era of, in their words, human-made climate change. Linda Perrine, an organizer with the Oregon Coalition for Environmental Rights Amendment, said that the amendment would serve a dual purpose. For one, it would increase the bar for environmental protections and give public officials a tool to regulate polluting industries, however that's going to be defined because every industry pollutes to one form or another, as does every household. And it would also include issuing permits for projects and things like that. But most importantly, Perrine says it also provides a basis for climate litigation. Now in Oregon, the amendment would be added for a legislative referral or ballot initiative. So, by Perrine's own words, as opponents of this say, the amendment would make lawfare much easier for environmentalists, allowing them essentially to control all land use in the state and economic activity regardless. And this comes at a time when agriculture is already under fire and struggling to survive in Oregon under democratic rule. There's also a huge need for homes and industries need to expand to provide jobs and tax revenue. Some of the pushback, interestingly enough, right now is even coming from the climate conscious clean energy sector. The developers there fear an environmental rights amendment could limit things like lithium mining, building, windmills or solar array panels and other green energy projects. Those projects, while needed to advance progressive demands for the clean energy transmission, would of course lead to environmental impacts, allowing even more radical environmentalists to say, you can't do that because we say so. So Oregon is spending $130,000 a month to an out-of-state nonprofit to run a Measure 110 hotline. So far this year, that hotline has received a number of calls. Now, that hotline was set up with Ballot Measure 110 here in Oregon that all but legalized the use of hard drugs and ownership of those drugs in the state of Oregon. Part of it was, well, if you're caught with drugs, you'll get a $100 citation, but... If you call the special hotline, we'll waive the $100 ticket, just if you talk to somebody. All right, so the state's paying $130,000 a month to have this out-of-state nonprofit answer the phones. So far this year, the hotline has received 73 calls. 73 from people with Measure 110 citations. So... Dollar-wise, what does that translate to? Approximately $10,700 per call. Now, that's according to the latest data from the Oregon Health Authority. 
this is not all of it. Keep in mind that this hotline used to be run by a nonprofit here in Oregon called Lines for Life. It was something that was already set up and mostly acts as kind of a counseling hotline and a referral service for people that have suicidal ideations. But they took it away from them because they said, well, you're not getting enough calls. So the state paid $2.7 million just to set this call system up, and then uh, $130,000 a month in payments over the term of the agreement. So for the first three months of the year, 49 people called. And then the number dropped to 24 from April through June. Only in Oregon. And finally, a track coach in Lagos, Oswego, who says he wants transgender athletes to compete in a separate division, basically for transgender athletes, is suing the school district after he says they fired him because he took his concerns to the district and the OSAA. John Parks has been coaching their track and field for 40 years. Now, the past two years at Lake Oswego High School, and in May, Parks sent a letter to the Oregon School Activities Association that oversees high school and school sports in Oregon. And it, the letter was after seeing a transgender athlete from another school win a whole bunch of girls' track events. Park wrote in the letter, quote, the transgender athletes that were competing and running fast, I could see just knowing how a sophomore boy is going to develop. He says he wrote the letter and said, this kid is going to keep getting better and better. He says, this is just naturally going to happen, and it's going to take away from the efforts of the girls. Parks also wrote, and this kid doesn't deserve scorn. They're going to have to face that. But I'm concerned about my kids and the parents who are voicing their concerns. Now, OSA's policy is to allow transgender athletes to compete with their gender identity. Parks was investigated and accused of encouraging spectators to boo the so-called transgender athlete, as well as encouraging coaches to boycott medal events. He's denied all of those accusations, but the Lake Oswego School District said, well, the evidence showed that he had engaged in discrimination and harassment and that they wouldn't renew his contract. So he's suing. Park's attorney claims it's a First Amendment violation, which is the basis of the lawsuit. Buck Doherty, his attorney with the Center for Liberty Justice, says, quote, they do not forfeit, meaning teachers, their First Amendment free speech rights just because they're public employees. So long as they're speaking as a private citizen on a matter of public concern, they're allowed to do that, and their public school employer in this situation can't retaliate against them. Across the country, of course, there's been an ongoing debate over how transgender athletes should participate in sports that are separated by actual gender. All right. There's a look at some of your news. Rick, it's time for you now to roll out a big industrial-sized extruded drum of reel. Get on it. 